Again, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending the Advanced Liposuction Techniques for Lipedema. We have on the phone with me Dr. David Amron, and he is out in the California Beverly Hills area. Dr. Amron is a board-certified dermatologic surgeon who specializes in lipedema treatment, liposuction, and body contouring. He's the medical director of the Roxbury Institute in Beverly Hills, California, and has an international reputation for excellence in successfully approaching complicated liposuction cases, including lipedema treatments and revision liposuction surgeries. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. David Amron. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for the very kind introduction. I'm sitting here in my uh, actual living room of Beverly Hills, uh, my home, and it's about 100 degrees outside with about 98% humidity, so a little bit unusual for us here in California, but I've got a fan pointed on me, and uh, we'll start to move ahead. So as Lisa said, my name is Dr. David Amron. For those, who don't, uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm in Beverly Hills. My practice is really focused on uh, liposuction for the past 20 years. Uh, Lisa, you can advance the slides for me? I will. There we go. Yeah, the previous slide actually had a website that I have called advancedlipedematreatment.com that's really focused specifically on lipedema if you want to, want to, want to uh, peruse that. So as I was saying, I'm a dermatologic surgeon. Uh, my practice is focused on liposuction for over 20 years now and all different aspects of it, size three bikini models, very overweight patients, um, a lot of complicated revision stuff from around the world uh, for many years. And right now, the vast majority of my practice is focused on lipedema, the disease we're going to talk about. And currently, I do between four and seven surgeries uh, every week. So lipedema, for those of you that don't know, has a very interesting history. Um, you know, it's, it's very under-recognized here in the United States, but, but we actually described it in the 1940s uh, at the Mayo Clinic. There was a landmark paper uh, about lipedema, but really not much was done with it. It was basically ignored. And, and really it was in Europe that they began to, to pay attention to it as a specific uh, distinct condition. There were many lymphedema clinics uh, in the Black Forest, the Feldy Clinic, and this and that, that really identified lipedema really as a separate uh, disease after that initial paper was written. It is a chronic progressive fat storage inflammatory disease. That's a very uh, important part of understanding. This is not just a fat storage condition. And one of the different fat storage conditions that we learn about in medical school, like adiposis de la Rosa and Durkheim's disease, it's very inflammatory. That plays a lot into, into how uh, these patients uh, have their symptoms and pain and how I go about treating it. There's a genetic component in about 50% of cases. In the other half of cases, there doesn't seem to be much of a, a genetic component to the condition. Um, there are as many as 17 million women in the U.S. with varying degrees of lipedema and 370 million worldwide. And i got to tell you, when I first saw those numbers uh, a few years ago, I was a little surprised myself. And, you know, I'm, you know, certainly I focus on liposuction. I see a lot of uh, patients with calf and ankle fat and this and that, so I'm diagnosing it a lot. But, you know, I, it doesn't surprise me. I, I, I absolutely think it's a very under-recognized condition, um, as the next little bullet point says, under-recognized and under-appreciated, uh, especially here in the United States. Uh, this is now what I call the dawn of lipedema. We're starting to get more and more understanding of the condition. Uh, it's commonly misdiagnosed. As the, you hear this over and over again from patients. They've been misdiagnosed, just told to go lose weight and, and exercise, but it's not a condition really of, of obesity. This is a fat storage inflammatory disease. Next slide. The symptom, the, the, let's see, where are you, Lisa? The signs Hi. of lipedema. So it really is, it's a clinical diagnosis. There's no blood test for lipedema. Um, it, it's, it's how the patient really pretty much looks and feels. It presents in puberty, uh, and it does worsen with hormonal changes. Uh, it, it, it gets worse with pregnancy. It tends to get worse with uh, menopause or, or hysterectomies. Um, so definitely a hormonal component, component. It's not caused by hormones, but the disease activity upticks with hormonal changes. Uh, it is a hypertrophy of the fat. So that word hypertrophy means it's growing more. It's not just storing more fat intracellularly. Studies have shown that there actually is duplication and mitosis of fatty tissue. Um, and it forms a very typical look. There's different uh, types of lipedema. The common type has this tree-like, column-like look to the legs all the way down from the groin all the way down to the ankle area. Uh, the arms are affected. Uh, you kind of see numbers anywhere between 30 and 50 percent 
Um, I think it's actually more than 50% of patients with lipidema have their arms affected. Uh, less commonly, uh, you see in other areas, the upper buttock area, uh, the, the abdomen sometimes. There are different stages of lipidema, uh, categorized as stage one mild to, to, to a severe stage four. And along with the, the fat, there is also, as we know, swelling. That's why the name is lip edema. There's commonly cuffing at the ankle area that is, that is a, you know, more unique to lip edema itself. You get this kind of circumferential cuffing in many patients. And the fibrosis is a very important component of the condition. Um, because it's an inflammatory condition, remember, there is chronic inflammation going on to the fatty tissue, uh, whether it's the stroma around the fat itself, um, around the blood vessels, around the lymphatics itself. Um, and many times patients get these fibrotic nodules you can actually feel on a clinical examination. We'll talk about when I do liposuction, how it many times plugs up my cannulas. Symptoms of lipedema, the patient's feeling. Pain and tenderness is a common symptom. Not always, um, but most patients do have pain and tenderness. When you, when you touch, or they, they get banged in a movie theater by, by somebody's hand, it, it does hurt. Uh, but it's really interesting. It's not always in relation to how bad or how big they are with, with a lipedema. You might have patients with stage three or stage four that have very little pain and tenderness and patients with stage one that has extreme pain and tenderness. Easy bruisability is, is also a, a common sign with lipedema. Uh, decreased mobility, especially as it starts to advance into its later stages. Uh, decreased proprioception. These patients have a hard time with balance many times. You know, many, many times they'll tell you that when they're in the shower and they close their eyes and they're shampooing their, their hair, they lose their balance. And, and one of the things that I many times will see after liposuction in a day or two is how that goes away. They're able to close their eyes in the shower and not lose their balance. There's heaviness that goes on and there's, there's numbness that goes on, goes on with the swelling too. So the medical management of lipedema has been, I, I hate to say, you know, frustrating. It, it's, it's, it, it helps with the condition. Um, and it can help to slow the progression, um, but, but it's, it's definitely been, been frustrating. The, the, the mainstay of therapy is around anti-inflammatory medications and, and supplements. Karen Herbs, who is a, a worldwide expert in lipedema, has a fantastic site that goes into all the different types of medications she uses and anti-inflammatory supplements um, that she finds helpful, helpful with lipedema patients. A diet um, does help, and again, if you go through Karen's site, uh, H-E-B-R-S-T, uh, there's a whole uh, regimen of, of uh, avoiding pro-inflammatory uh, foods that can uptick the activity of lipedema. Exercise is important, but you know I hear over and over again from patients that it only goes so far. Uh, decongestive and compression therapy is really the mainstay of treatment in most of these patients. Uh, either using compression garments, uh, getting manual lymphatic drainage done by by trained therapists. Uh, or sometimes uh, therapy with compression pumps, like the FlexiTouch pump that they either use at home themselves or go into offices and get treated. Lisa? Oh, it wouldn't change, sorry. <laughs> there we go. So my philosophy on liposuction surgery, I think it's always important to have a philosophy in pretty much anything in life. And my philosophy on liposuction is liposuction is really about targeting disproportion in a patient's body, identifying where they are genetically disproportionate and using liposuction as a tool to target that disproportion and create balance and proportion. Regardless of weight, regardless of exercise, um, it's about uh, targeting disproportion. That same philosophy I apply to lipidium patients. They are very disproportionate and the same philosophy applies. It's about creating balance and proportion of a person's body. And I talk about my way of going about doing the surgery circumferentially, it's all about creating balanced portions of the patient's body. Um, liposuction, as we all know, is not a substitute for weight loss, nor diet, nor muscle tone, nor exercise. <clears throat> Consultation to me is, is a very important part of, of, of uh, the, the surgical experience. Um, it's about whether I'm doing it face-to-face -face with a patient or I'm doing it in a phone, uh, photo phone or Skype consultation. It's about defining a treatment plan for the patient. It's not about the patient coming in and saying, I want to I wanna do this. It's, it's really our responsibility to, to convey to the patient what we feel is the proper treatment plan with life restriction to, to balance their body out. And that same thing goes on with lipedema too. I define a treatment plan in every single patient I see, whether it's one surgery, two surgeries, three surgeries, and, and how I go about it. I look at their body from their neck down to their ankle, and I target disproportion. 
So a word about fat and flab. Um, you know, as as surgeons, um, you know, if you do liposuction, we all come 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 across this. Patients grab things, they want to shake it around, and they want to lay, label everything as fat. And I think it's important for the surgeon to understand the differences and the patient, absolutely, in terms of expectations. What's liposuction doing? Liposuction is removing subcutaneous fat. So when you're grabbing, and in the photograph here, that person's grabbing that, that big roll, you know, you ask them what they're grabbing, they're going to say they're grabbing fat. But is it all fat? Well, it's obviously not all fat. There's, there's, there's different layers. There's skin. There's subcutaneous fat. There's a connective tissue sheet. There's a muscle layer. And there's the internal visceral of fat inside the belly itself. Uh, but the patient thinks everything they're grabbing, shaking around that's loose is, is, is fat, but I like to call it flab, and I distinguish what is fat and what is flab. And it's very important in terms of getting the patient on the same line in terms of uh, expectations. So the co components of flab are, are, are such. You know, it could be overweight, and, and patient thinks it's flab and just have fullness there. Uh, there's disproportion that's involved in the flab. Muscle tone and laxity, again, when, when you're grabbing things, you're shaking it around. Many times, it's the muscle that is, is shaking around that's loose, that the patient just thinks is, is fat. And again, remember, you know, the muscle, as we all know, has fat in it. When we eat prime rib or whatever, there's marbling in that meat. So as you get, uh, when you come overweight or you're not working out, the muscle itself gets fatty too. Skin laxity is another component of flab. And lastly, the last component that I like to say is, is, is cellulite, um, the, the, the irregularity we'll talk about later. So you want to be a lipedema surgeon, I title this slide. And, and, and I, I don't want to, you know, I know there's, there's those that are, that are on this webinar to, to, that are doing lipedema surgery and those that are looking to do it. And I just, I've got to just say this, that, that you know, I, I, lipedema surgery to me is, is, is a very particular thing. And, and it's, it's, I don't think it's just for beginners. I think you've got to have a very high level of technical skill with liposuction. I think liposuction itself is many times not given the right type of respect um, in terms of, of how difficult it is in every single patient to get the best result. And that really is very much true in lipedema, especially true in lipedema. Um, needs great technical skill, great judgment. These patients are different. We're going to talk about that. Um, and a lot of experience with liposuction. Why? Well, the first reason is that lipidemia patients have their fat disproportion is in complicated areas. The areas that are most commonly not done with liposuction. I'm in Beverly Hills, and I got to tell you, um, it's maybe one in ten surgeons in Beverly Hills that are plastic surgeons and derm surgeons that do calf and ankle liposuction. It, it, it's more particular. You're doing a very thin layer that occurs very quickly. You've got to really understand how to go about it, um, and it's it's not something to be taken very lightly. Um, the anterior thighs and knees, another virtually always uh, involved in lipidemia patients, um, an area that's not commonly done by most, most liposuction surgeons. And when I do the anterior thighs, I don't just do on top of the knee. We're going to look at some slides. I do the whole thing all the way up to the groin as a unit. Um, these areas tend to be more fibrous uh, just, just by, 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 by nature, the calf and ankle area and the anterior thigh area. And in lipidemia patients, they're, they're even that much more fibrous. Uh, many of these patients have lipolymphedema, and this is a very important thing to understand that that lipidemia patients, by nature, are more fibrotic. It's an inflammatory condition, and some it becomes more advanced and becomes lipolymphedema. So if you're going to put your put yourself out there and say I'm a lipidemia surgeon, you will eventually get all types of lipidemia patients, not just your stage one and stage two. You get your stage three and stage four and complicated patients, lipolymphedema, and having the right understanding and judgment of when to go in, when not to go in, how to go about it, what is the, 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 the next bullet point, is the involved pre- and post-surgical care in these patients. These patients need many times more pre-surgical care in terms of compression therapy and understanding when to go in. They have more involved post-surgical care than your typical liposuction patients. Um, and the liposuction itself should be lymphatic sparing. Well, we'll talk about this also, but, but you can damage uh, lymphatics in these in, in patients and in lipidemia patients it can be a disaster and, and create more problems with things um, so you've got to really understand how to approach it you know wall as we're going to talk about is a big part of it but for, as far as I'm concerned it's the skill to stay in that subcutaneous layer of fat throughout your entire surgery my approach with liposuction you know I strongly prefer the approach of to mess into anesthesia um, the thing which was developed by Jeff Klein uh, Durham surgeon like myself in the 1980s. Um, it's my approach 
with liposuction in almost all patients. I don't prefer general anesthesia. Um, I, I do it in some patients. I can do it. I, I, I own a accredited surgical center, um, but it's not my preferred approach, and I'll, and I'll explain why. My patients uh, are monitored with IV during the entire surgery, and I do all my procedures in an accredited surgical center. Advantages of tumescent local anesthesia. Um, number one is safety. Um, it, it's definitely a safer approach. Uh, there's been many studies, uh, really one of the landmark studies goes back to the year 2000, plastic reconstructive surgery, showing one in 5,000 mortality rate of liposuction under general anesthesia, especially when combined with other procedures and longer operating times. Uh, local anesthesia, when done properly, has a, a very, very high and essentially completely safe track record. Um, it's also a cleaner, gentler way to do it. When it's done properly with tumescing, remember the word tumescing means to blow up with fluid. You are hydrisecting. Um, the, um, you're creating a bloodless field. There generally is less bleeding and bruising with the surgery, and that makes for faster recovery and healing, less bruising. There's also less of the nauseating effects of general anesthesia. The main reason why I don't like uh, low, uh, excuse me, general anesthesia is technically to me, it's a, it's a technical disadvantage. This is the main reason. Um, under lipos are very different procedures. Most procedures, you want your patient moving around while you're doing the surgery. Um, excuse me, you want your patient lying still while you're doing the surgery, when you're cutting into them and this and that. With liposuction, it's a sculpting and contouring procedure, and you're staying in a layer of that, and the patient not being able to move with certain orientations is a technical disadvantage. And uh, so that's the main reason. Um, I think that under general anesthesia, there's a lot more jabbing of muscles going on by the surgeon and the cannula tip, unnecessarily causing bleeding and bruising, and sometimes causing, you know, worse than that if they enter into body cavities and, and damage the organ. But more importantly, poking and jabbing the skin from underneath and getting uneven results. Um, and again, it's supposed to be lymphatic sparing to mass into anesthesia because it forces you to stay in that subcutaneous plane of fat where there are no deeper lymphatic branches and trunks, only, lymphat only the lymphatic capillaries. Lisa? So while in my practice, um, I got to say, and I, know, I know Lisa and CareStream America have, have, have um, asked me to speak, um, and Lisa knows I'm very straightforward and honest and speak my mind about things. I do love wall. I, I absolutely do. Um, I use it in every patient, uh, lipedema or not, uh, but absolutely in every single lipedema patient. To me, wall is, is a, a significant advancement of, of tumescent local anesthesia. It's a much more sophisticated way of approaching it than other ways of putting in the fluid. And it's really become indispensable in every case of liposuction I do for a number of factors. It, 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 it saves time. It saves back pain. When you do seven lipedema cases a week, you know, your back starts to take its toll on things. And, and anything you can do to increase efficiency and help with the procedure um, is good, but it's also, like this next slide slow, uh, shows, it's, it's an efficient, gentler way of tumescing and putting the local anesthesia. Um, it, it, the way it kind of squirts and pushes into the tissue is, is, is fabulous. It's, it's, it's great. Um, the patient generally feels less as it's squirting in than other ways of putting in local anesthesia. Um, this is an important factor. You are able to use less fluid, even if you use it in, in creative ways. You know, the way in which wall is, is usually demonstrated being done is smaller, smaller areas at a time where you're putting the fluid in and you're moving the fat at the same time. We'll talk about how I do it in a little bit of a different fashion, and I've done it in, in, in both ways, but regardless, you're using less fluid. In lipedema patients, it's an advantage because there's less fluid overload in their tissues and they have less swelling. But the most important reason for me is it's transformed my practice and that I can do larger areas at the same time because I don't have to worry as much about lidocaine levels. Uh, a slide later on shows that I keep lidocaine levels uh, below 55 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And so what this allows me to do is to extend the surface area that I'm doing. It's allowed me to do the circumferential thighs as one surgery. I couldn't do that before. It is excellent at hydrodissecting fatty tissue um, and fibrotic tissue. It really kind of pushes through that very, very nicely. And I got to tell you, you know, for fat transfer, it is really the best fat I've seen. It's a very, very poor, excuse me, very pure quality of fat for fat transfer. 55 milligrams per kilogram body weight. This is the number that I keep um, every patient uh, uh, at or below with every surgery. And this determines how much you can do at one time. It's a, it's a calculation. Uh, if they weigh 100 kilograms, um, then you can use so much, so, so many milligrams of lidocaine. 
Um, I use a variation of the Klein solution, um, which is uh, instead of putting, if I remember correctly, it's 100 milligrams of lidocaine in each liter bag. Um, I many times dilute that and use 75 milligrams in each liter of, uh, of, of saline. Many times using five, six, seven, even eight liters in larger patients, but I'm always keeping that below 55 milligrams per kilogram of body weight to avoid any chance of lidocaine toxicity. Um, I do, if I'm doing uh, surgeries um, in patients and I'm maxing out of my lidocaine levels or I'm going to potentially go above that, I will divide those surgeries and do them two days apart or more to avoid lidocaine toxicity. In lipidia of patients, though, if I'm doing more than one procedure, sometimes it's longer than two days. We're going to talk about that. Proper to messing is an art. You know, and I, I think it really, really is. This is where you've got a conscious patient and you better be really great at sneaking that fluid in with them feeling as little as possible. If you've lost them in terms of causing them a lot of pain putting the fluid, they're going to give you a much harder time when you're doing the surgery itself too. So, so you really want to be very good in terms of how you sneak that fluid in and, and, and do it very gently and always advance your field. You know, I remember when I took a course years ago um, and watched a surgeon do it, he had his staff doing the tumescing and, you know, I, I don't do that. I, I do all the tumescing myself. Maximum fat per surgery that can be removed, I think we all know this number uh, as surgeons. In the U.S., it's five liters, um, whether it's general or local anesthesia that we like to keep within uh, with each surgery. In Europe, many times I'll go a little beyond that. Um, I have gone, you know, a little beyond that, but I try to keep it five liters per surgery as a maximum. Liposculpture, uh, you know, if you do it, you, you understand it's, it really is a very artful procedure. It, it's, it's much more than just sucking fat out. It's, it's, it's not sucking, it's really tunneling. You are, it is liposculpture, not liposuction. It is extremely technique and operator dependent. It really is all about the person doing it, much more about the person than what tools or gadgets they use. And Lisa's heard me say this many times that, again, you know, these are all just tools to get to your endpoint, but it's ultimately the skill of the surgeon. Um, you have, I have respect for cosmetic units. Uh, I, as, over the years, I've, I've learned to not break up cosmetic units in patients, and we'll talk about that. I have a three-dimensional approach to sculpting. Um, and again, I, as I'll say, it's not about the tools used, it's more about the technique, the artistry, the skills and judgment of the surgeon, and one of the analogies I like to use is a haircut. You know, a great haircut is about the skills of the person doing it, it's not about what, what, what scissors or tools they're, they're grabbing to get a great haircut. Three-dimensional contouring, I really apply this to all patients. Um, I do not break up cosmetic units, I really don't like to. Um, I do cosmetic units in their entirety, um, whether I'm doing the calves and ankle area, I've applied the same thing to the thigh area in, in, in a unique way. I don't think many surgeons are doing the thigh three-dimensionally all the way around the way I do. Um, I do this with the, with the upper arm area too. Uh, I do this with the torso. Um, when I do the torso, most commonly I'm doing three-dimensionally all the way around. Uh, the entire torso from the axle all the way down to the pubis and the waistline too. Um, in, uh, in, with lipidemia patients, I'm able to accomplish a complete treatment plan in uh, usually two surgeries. Sometimes it's just localized areas, it may be one surgery, sometimes it's three surgeries. Very rarely I may go into a fourth surgery. The way I group things is that I will commonly group the, the circumferential thigh area from the groin area down to the knees as a unit all the way around itself. You'll see some of my markings later on. Uh, sometimes I will do some of the buttock area if I'm able to from a lidocaine standpoint or the buttock can be done as a separate surgery if it's involved. Uh, another surgery I, I will group is commonly the calf and ankle area along with the arms. In almost all patients, I'm able to do the calf and ankle area and the arms at one surgery um, and keep within 55 milligrams per kilogram body weight, and usually they're not needing to, to remove more than five liters from, from those areas combined. Um, and again, the circumferential torso. If the torso is involved in lipedema, that becomes its own surgery. So lipidemia patients, um, they're really quite different than your liposuction patient. I mean, they, they're similar because it's liposuction, they've got disproportion, but, but they're different. They're, they're more complicated. They're complicated areas, like I mentioned. Um, they're, 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 they tend to be more fibrous, um, sometimes extremely fibrous, these patients. They generally have an increased um, amount of cellulite along with their lipedema. I don't think the lipedema is causing the cellulite, but I will tell you that I think that, that there is an increased incidence of cellulite in lipedema patients. Um, and as we know, cellulite is a little more challenging to deal with with liposuction. You've got to really know, un know and understand how to go about 
uh, go, go about dealing with cellulite. With liposuction, you can usually get a great improvement of cellulite in the right hands. In the wrong hands, you create more regularities. And sometimes, again, I will use laser in patients we'll talk about. Time interval between surgeries. Um, this is the way I go about it in most patients. Um, you know, I know that in other areas of the world, they will wait longer in every single patient. They will wait two or four weeks between surgeries. I, I don't do this. I, I'll tell you, I've done hundreds of patients, all different types, and I find that in stage one and early stage two patients, I can do them two days apart um, and, and get fantastic results and have very little swelling afterwards in most patients. I did the patients last week. Surgery number one on Tuesday, surgery number two yesterday, um, and she's doing fantastically today. So stage one, early stage two, usually two days apart or more if the patient wants it. Uh, stage two, um, you know, usually if they're, they're really truly stage two or stage two plus, I'll wait five to seven days between surgery. Stage two to stage three, I wait a week or two weeks. And stage three or stage four, um, with especially lipolymphedema, I do wait. I usually will wait four weeks between surgeries. Now, why is this? You know, it does begin to affect swelling and healing and recovery as there is a greater, greater degree of congestion in the tissues. Um, so, so I do think waiting as the disease itself advances, waiting long between surgery is, is, is an important thing. Incision points, please excuse the slide. This is a slide of actually my associate, uh, Jason Emmer, that I grabbed. Um, just, a, just an example of an incision point, but here's a guy with high def liposuction. But incision points, just forget the visual of the slide. You know, the, the, there are two to three millimeter slits in the skin. Usually I leave the lower ones open. The upper ones I may leave open or put one little stitch in just to oppose them. Um, but really the, 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 the placement is so extremely crucial in, in, with liposuction. I think if you do a lot of liposuction, you understand this. You're off a little bit with your placement. You're not going to get the best, best result with things. And that's absolutely important. With, with the areas that lipedema patients have, uh, have involved, uh, especially the calf and ankle area. Where you place your incision points from a strategic standpoint is, is, is immensely important. The role of counter-attraction. Um, you know, I could write a little, little, little small chapter about this. You know, how that skin, that tissue is supported by myself, by my left hand as I'm doing the surgery and my left wrist starts to ache and the tech that I'm working with in terms of stretching that skin out as a tight sheet to me, it's very important. You know, to me, I want stability as I'm doing my liposuction. I want to stay, that muscle stabilized, and that's where the patient that is awake or conscious can tighten up their muscle, and I want that skin stabilized. I want to stretch it like a tight sheet. So counter-traction is very important as I'm doing my liposuction. And to me, liposuction is a very precise procedure that should be done in a very, very methodical fashion in every patient. Lisa? Okay. Respect the skin exclamation point. I, I, you know, the skin is hugely important in terms of getting a great result in liposuction. With lipedema, you know, I, I approach from the standpoint of not only treating the disease, but also the aesthetic standpoint uh, of it also getting the best aesthetic result. And a lot of it has to do with how I deal with the skin. So just like, like you go to a, 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 a park, Yosemite, they say, don't feed the bears, don't do this, don't do that. With regard to liposuction, there's no jabbing. No poking, no tenting, no grabbing the skin disrespectfully, no dragging the cannula. When you're doing this, you're irritating the dermis from underneath, and you're going to increase your chance of irregularity. So respect the skin. Sculpt evenly and precisely, and, and think in terms of forming a, a, a layer of connective tissue under the, the, the skin that's going to attract back evenly. I personally start deep and debulk from the bottom up, how I go about doing liposuction, and, and I move across that plane. It's almost like debulking the ocean from the bottom up, and I, and I approach that skin from underneath with a lot of respect, and I'm thinking in terms of creating a, a sheet of contractile collagen to, retra to retract evenly. Um, also, so temper dermal retraction um, and aggressiveness with the skin elasticity. If the skin, as the skin elasticity gets worse and you get wrinkly skin, you better be very careful how you're dealing with that skin with liposuction. And you want to go for some dermal retraction, but not too much. If you're going to use things like laser and this and that, and you go for excessive dermal retraction, it will retract, but you'll create more regularities. Cellulite, we talked about this. I do think it's increased, so you see more of it in lipedema patients. We know that this, what this is, basically, it's fibrous, septi, vertically arranged. There's a genetic hormonal components to it. You know, over the years I've done liposuction, I have almost always gotten cellulite to greatly improve, and it has to do with how you deal with that superficial, 
fat layer, those fibrous bands, I did life suction for years with spatula cannulas um, on the body uh, under the skin, and they were absolutely fantastic in terms of subsizing those fibrous bands. Sometimes I'll still use them. Um, I think the laser can be beneficial uh, with with the cellulite and the fibrous bands. Sometimes I will use cell, cell, cellulase in patients. Just a little visual of, of, of cellulite. Um, you guys all know, all know what this is. You can advance. A little visual of cellulite. Let's get this to Lisa. Okay. So these are these are this is a patient. You can see a bunch of patients beforehand. These were all done in the last couple months or so. So I don't have afters yet. I usually take after photographs. About six months after, um, and in, 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 in many patients, especially with lipedema, you know, it's really about a year to get your final result with things, sometimes even more. But, but these are some examples of the way I approach things. Again, I, I do the whole thigh all the way around as, as I mark it. Um, it's done as a cosmetic unit from the, 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 the pubic area all the way down to the knees, the anterior knee area, the lateral knee area, the medial knee area, the posterior thigh area circumferentially all the way around. If you're wondering how I do it, well, I, I, don't, I don't usually put in, I do it all as one surgery, but I don't do, uh, I don't to mess the area with wall all at one time. I'll usually to mess uh, three quarters of it and then connect it and do, let's say, the posterior thigh area after the other areas are done, but it's done as one unit and all blended in perfectly, so I'm not going back and, and connecting things with strips. You know, in Germany, I know for whatever reason, they'll do things in strips or parts of thighs or one leg and the other leg. Uh, again, you know, more patients you can see the outer thigh area, the, uh, the, the inner thigh area, the posterior thigh was also done too. Keep going, Lisa. These are all lipedema patients. Uh, calves and ankles. Um, you know, just looking at the slide here, this is your, your, your kind of average stage two lipedema patient. Her thighs are more affected than her calves and ankles, but the calves and ankles need to be done. So the calves and ankles were done first along with her arms, and I do it all the way around, 360 degrees. I, I don't miss anything at the time of surgery. Again, I do the posterior three quarters first, then the anterior quarter at the end. Um, where the incision points are placed is the most important thing in the calf and ankle area and, lear and learning where to place your incision points. You better get that anterior component though. Um, if you don't, the patient will still have lipedema there and will still continue to swell. It's amazing how much fat comes out of that anterior component in the pretibial area. But, you know, again, a very complicated area. You've got to have a great skill set in terms of approaching areas like this and staying in that proper plane. That plane is very thin sometimes. It's very fibrous. You've got to follow that plane. A lot of it is positioning of the patient, my positioning. <laughs> so again, more, more photos of just markings. More marking photographs. And again, marking photographs. Yep. Yep. You kind of get the, get the idea. This is just a before and after here. This is where, you know, what you can achieve in the right hands, excuse, excuse me for saying that, but, you know, with, with, the, with the right type of way of approaching things, this was done um, uh, 360 degrees all the way around in two surgeries, her legs, um, from her groin area all the way down to her ankles. Um, and you can kind of see the, 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 the degree of improvement all the way around in this patient. Keep going. It's amazing results. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so you know, you get you know, not a this this woman, you know, I, I just gotta say, it's so sweet. She she says said she says a prayer for me every night um, when she goes to sleep after her surgery, and it's not because of how she looks, but how she feels because it it she suffered for 20 years with liposuction. There's a little video on her Yasmin's her name, and 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 the pain just went away. Her her li whole lifestyle changed. There's an amazing degree of satisfaction from these patients. So this is a slide one. One to simply, you know, do liposuction and, and, and call it a day. It, it's not with lipid patients. It's very important. You know, the, the care for these patients before and after for a while is very, very important. It's not like your typical liposuction patient. So for post postoperative care, my patients are, are 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 milked and drained on the table. The lower incisions are left open. The upper incisions I usually put one little opposing stitch in. 
uh, patients are on antibiotics. Uh, I, I, I use it for generally a five-day period starting the day before surgery. Uh, patients are put into compression garments. Most patients are bandaged from stage two or stage two uh, up. Um, the ones that tend to be more swellers, I will also bandage. Other ones that don't have such a swelling problem, I, I don't feel the bandaging is really imperative in every patient, and this is a great area of controversy among, among many, many surgeons and lymphatic therapists. Um, I do think that MLD therapy is, is important. I think it's mandatory in, in, in patients with stage 3, stage 4 lipolymphedema. I think it's very, very helpful in stage 1 and stage 2 patients after surgery. So usually for one or two times a week for several weeks, MLD therapy is important. Uh, supplements, um, you know, usually patients are on supplements. They put on by Karen Herbs or whatever. They would begin their anti-inflammatory supplements after the surgery. Uh, I see a lot of out-of-town patients. It's about 90% of my practice. Um, I do a photo Skype consultation uh, with these patients um, for a long time on the phone. Uh, I define a treatment plan based on their photographs, and I'm able to, to, to pretty much nail it every time. There's, there, there's, it's rare that I change my plan when I see them in person the day before the surgery. Uh, many patients get medical clearance, uh, liberty patients many times have other conditions. Um, or past the age of 50, and I do get medical clearance on these patients. Every patient has a blood test, PBC, PT, PDT, your standard blood tests. My patients arrive the day before surgery, but I have not met them. I confirm um, my treatment plan in a face-to-face -face consultation. Some patients get pre, uh, pre-compression pump therapy done prior to surgery. Um, surgery and surgeries are then done. Okay, next, next bullet point. And then patients are many times wrapped after surgery, MLD therapy. Um, Let's uh, then then they, okay fly home. So let's talk about this. I I uh, each patient is 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 individual. Um, many patients I feel, and I've done this with liposuction for years, can fly home two days later. Most surgeons don't approach it that way and will wait. I don't feel that it's important. I feel as long as they are moving around a little bit on the flight, and they are moving their legs around, and they get up every hour, hour and a half, and walk around a little bit it's completely fine to do. So most of my patients will fly back two days after the surgery. If they're stage one and many times stage two patients, if they're more complicated patients and have more issues with swelling that I'm concerned about, I will have them stay longer than that, many times a week, sometimes as much as two weeks after the surgery. So uh, team approach. Um, you know, there, there is a team approach with lipedema. It's not just about, you know, only doing the surgery. You know, these pa I think it's very important to involve uh, you know, a, a good internist, uh, ideally endocrinologist. I work very closely with Dr. Karen Hertz in these patients and define treatment plans. Um, so, so the medical uh, 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 treatment is important. Uh, certainly surgical, my role in things, uh, MLD therapy, whether it's a vodder therapist or other MLD therapist, becomes very, very important. Uh, plastic surgeon, um, you know, I'm not a plastic surgeon. I'm a germ surgeon who specializes in liposuction. But I work with plastic surgeons if there's a consideration that patients may need lifting procedures done afterwards um, in certain patients. And I think there's also the importance of nutritionists uh, in patients in terms of getting them on the right uh, diet plan. Uh, complementary treatments, I really, I can't say I think there's much value in patients. I don't like patients wasting money on things. I offer this stuff in my practice, liposomics, ultra-shave, bell-shave, free for cellulite, thermosh for skin tightening. I rarely use it on lipidium patients. So refining protocols for lipedema, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that still need to be defined. What's a proper medical workup in patients? Still continuing to refine the preoperative therapy that should be done in patients. Um, the role of preoperative decongestive therapy. What patients is it mandatory for? What patients is it is it nice to do on? Postoperative decongestive decompression therapy also. You know the role of it in every patient. I think that again in in, in more advanced patients it's mandatory. In other patients, it's a nice thing to do. Uh, what sort of supplements should, should these patients be on? Refining nutrition and exercise programs, and then and then working with plastic surgeons in terms of surgical protocols for patients that may need lifting procedures or tucking procedures. So this is my last slide. I've used this before. <laughs> it's the uh, Wrigley's Double Mint Gum that I think is still around, but I grew up in the 60s and 70s. And there was that Double Mint commercial with the twins that was always on TV, and it just reminds me of, you know, in in lifting with patients, there's such a a double fold of, of, of many things. They get a double fold uh, improvement in, in how they look. Um, 
aesthetically and how they feel. That's a huge thing. Um, you know, it, it's such a double-fold improvement for me in terms of making these patients look look better and feel better too. They get the double-fold improvement because their fat, you know, goes down. But along with that, they many times will get that double-fold improvement because the swelling just goes along with it too. That, that fat is acting like a sponge holding on to the swelling. So, so it's really a, a great level of, of additional satisfaction uh, treating the lifting patient. I'm proud to do that. Thank you, Dr. Amron. That was great. There are a couple questions that have come in. Um, the first question is, do you um, have any patients that are trying to put this through insurance? Well, absolutely. You know, that, that, that's you know, a, a big question. It's a good question. It's, it's, it's an area that is in flux. It's, it's a challenging area. The insurance companies are still not really recognizing it as a distinct disease, and I hope hopefully that will change with increased awareness, that we're all trying to increase awareness of this condition. They still commonly view liposuction as a cosmetic condition. Um, cer certain patients are having successes with insurance companies. I think the best strategy is to see as many people as possible, like Dr. Herbs and other specialists and orthopedists if, if, if they've got joint issues and all point to the same thing that they recommend liposuction surgery and then submit it um, and, 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 and continue to, to battle with the insurance companies. And as we as surgeons can, can help these patients, you know, many times it can be challenging being in network because our hands many times can be tied with patients, um, but as much as we can help patients to, to achieve uh, insurance reimbursements, uh, that's great. But still, right now, it's, it's, it's poor. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, the other question is, do you have a separate section of your practice that handles the, lipos that handles the lipedema patients versus uh, other patients that are coming in for other reasons, other liposuction reasons? Well, that, that, that's, that's another great question, and, and, and you know, it's really apropos because I'm right now in the process of moving. I've been in practice uh, uh, 20 years. I've been in the facility I'm in right now for 17 years with a two-hour surgical center. And I'm building a, a, a large uh, 6,000 square foot facility in Beverly Hills called the Roxbury Institute that you saw in the, in the first slide. And it's going to go a little more in the direction of, of being complete care for patients. Um, there's a surgical center there. And then I'm probably going to also involve uh, uh, compression therapists and MLD therapy and have more of a comprehensive approach to lifting patients. That's wonderful. I think that's really important for people to realize that, and you did hit on it, that the lipedema patients, uh, there's so much more to their treatment than just doing the liposuction. Yeah, uh, I, 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 do, I mean, I'd say I don't think you really want to dabble in it. Um, you know, if you're going to put yourself out there as being a lipedema surgeon, you know, really understand this condition and really learn and, and before you just start jumping in and, and, and doing patients, you know, I, I, I honestly would like this to go the direction of a society for lipedema surgery with proper types of um, education and and testing and this and that before people really start to jump in and do and do lipedema patients because they're more complicated. They are. Absolutely. Well, and I think sometimes you can do more harm than good um, by, by treating them and not know that. I think so. You know, I, I, I do, and, and I'm, I, I do have concern about that. And some of these patients, like I tell you, are, are high risk. And every month or so I'm doing a patient that, you know, makes me a little bit nervous with things. And thank God, you know, I've, I've made very good decisions with every patient. I'm very cautious and careful of when I delay things or this and that. I've done patients who have, you know, they have an increased incidence of factor five deficiency and clotting, clotting disorders. And, you know, they are higher risk patients. I think in Germany, they do have a lot of respect for it. I got to tell you, I think they really go through more of a rigorous um, training in terms of doing lipedema surgery. And I really want to see things in the U.S. go that direction. Wonderful. Well, I think with surgeons like you, uh, we will definitely move forward with that. And I uh, I do think that there's more and more people um, very cognizant of treating lipedema patients, and hopefully one day all the doctors and everybody will know how to diagnose it. That's another key factor. Yep, absolutely. I agree okay. with that. Thank you, Dr. Amron, for your time. Thank you, everyone on the line, uh, for your time. Uh, once we end this call, there'll be an email that you'll get with a quick little survey. We did record this call, and we'll send you out a um, link to be able to view it, and you can share it with anybody you'd like. Thank you again for Great. your time, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend. Let me just say one last thing. You still on? Yes. You still on? Uh -huh. Let me say one last thing. You know, if anybody wants to give me a call, 
um, or send me some questions or, or call my office. I'll be glad to talk to them more about things. And the best way to do that is look me up, look at my, my phone number, uh, ask for Christina, my, my surgical coordinator, who's sitting next to me right now, and I'll be glad to talk to them more about things. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Dr. Amron. I'll share that information as well with the group. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone.